about you, but I'm out of breath now. Come on, they did great, didn't they? Man, the energy for the first three songs, ready to rock and roll. Like, I mean, if that don't fire you up, I don't know what will. Uh, so if you're just kind of sitting, just hanging out, you're probably going to be that way for the rest of the time today. But if you're fired up, come on, I believe uh, as we close out this whole series, Donkeys, Elephants, and Jesus. Come on, talking all things politics and how Jesus relates in the middle of all of that. Uh, I believe he's got something for us today. You ready for it? Yeah. Come on, I, uh, if you're brand new, my name's Eric, and I just want to welcome you to church. My wife and I get the honor of pastoring here, and uh, I mean, you could be anywhere else on a Sunday morning. Come on, but I know the reason why you came. I do know. And it probably has less to do with Jesus than what I would hope, but here's what I know, is all the Alabama fans and all the Auburn fans came to church today to give Jesus some praise, because we are no longer losers. We are now both winners, right? So it doesn't matter who you cheer for. You came, you came to give Jesus some praise because you're winners today. Come on, everybody, right? Hey, if you, got a, uh, if you got a Bible, go two places with me. Luke 24 is our theme verse for the whole year. We read it almost every single Sunday of the year. Come on, if you don't have any verse memorized, after 2024, you should at least have Luke 24, 27 memorized, right? So Luke 24, 27, and then we're going to go to the book of Galatians. We're going to spend the rest of our time in the book of Galatians. Our whole goal for 2024 is to find Jesus in all of Scripture. Why? Because we thought it would be a cool idea? No. Because he said... He was in the middle of all of Scripture. So come on, stand to your feet. Uh, let's honor the reading of the Word. Come on, one verse. We're going to pray, and then you can have a seat for the rest of the time. This is what it says. In beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, talking about who? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus explained to them what was said in? All, all Scriptures concerning yes. himself. So from the mouth of Jesus himself, he says, your whole Bible is about me. So how does that relate to politics? Guess what? Jesus is all about politics because Jesus is the perfect king that is coming to set up the perfect kingdom. What about that statement is not political? See, so Jesus is not only right in the middle of Scripture. If that's true, then he's got to be right in the middle of every part of our lives, even in the nasty, messy, political side of it. So let's pray and let's figure out how we can close this series out today. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that we can trust you no matter what we see in front of us. God, we give you glory today. God, open our eyes, open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. God, and let us have enough courage to put it into practice in our lives. God, change us in the way that only you can. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we jump in real quick, you can go on and go to Galatians if you want to. Uh, but I want to give you some, some, some stuff that's going to happen about six weeks from now. It ain't about. It is six weeks from now. Six weeks. Six weeks from now. Everybody say six. Six. Six, six weeks from now, we are going into our Vision Builders Sunday. You know what a Vision Builders Sunday is? For those of you who don't know, Vision Builders Sunday is the one time a year that everybody who calls church with you home jumps in and becomes a vision builder. So vision builders uh, are, are people who self-identify themselves. We don't call them out. We don't pick them out. People that are vision builders self-identify themselves. And the way that they do that is they say, we give over and above our tithes to accelerate the vision that God wants to do through our church, right? So they self-identify themselves, but one time a year, come on, how many of you are grateful <laughs> that as a church, we don't do multiple offerings all throughout the year. Hey, next week, we're going to take up an offering so that we can keep the lights on, <laughs> right? How many of you are grateful the air conditioner is going to work yeah. next Sunday and we ain't got to take up a special offer? I don't actually know that it's going to work. It may break, <laughs> but we'll fix it yeah. and do our best to try to make it work. We don't have to come before you for average, uh, normal, everyday expenses and go, hey, we need to take up an offering. Aren't you grateful for a church that has stewarded it a little bit like that? Right, so, but one time a year, second Sunday in December, December the 8th, uh, is Vision Builder Sunday. Every single one of us are coming together to accelerate the vision of the church. So, if you remember anniversary Sunday, September 20, whatever that was, second, September 21st is the anniversary, but whatever Sunday that was this year, uh, we, we made the big announcement that you own, free and clear. Come on, Church of You is debt free, and you own 10 acres of land, everybody. That's a big deal. 
Right? That's a big, massive deal. Nobody can take that from you. You can do whatever you want to out there. You can go dance a little bit. You can fish in the pond. Nobody can say anything to you. How about that? And, uh, but the whole goal is to accelerate the vision, to see a building built in that. So we had a vision builders dinner one night, and, uh, and I went, hey, congratulations. We paid off the land. That's incredible. Like God did an amazing work in and through us. But to move into the next phase of the break ground process, we need $125,000. That's what I told him. Right, $125,000. Now, here's what's really cool is, uh, is before, the, that, the day before that meeting, there was a couple checks that were given that we had no earthly idea. Y'all want to know, don't you? You want to know where we stand for the 125 on Vision Builders? So with that few people uh, got together and, and that few people have already given 22% of our goal. That's $27,100, everybody. Isn't that awesome? That's incredible. And all that was given before we even brought it to you. Right, so now we're going, okay, six weeks from now, we, we need to start praying now, whatever God wants to do in and through our lives, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot, I don't care. The only thing I care about is that you're obedient to what God has told you to do because my Bible tells me that you shouldn't give under compulsion, but you should choose what you want to give, right? So therefore I'm giving you six weeks. So let's start praying now, figure out how, how and what God wants to do in and through us for our Vision Builders offering on December 8th. That was pretty good news, was it not? Yes. All right, so now let's, uh, let's close the series. I was thinking through, uh, through this whole series, we've already walked through how to vote, right? We told you from day one, we're not telling you who to vote, but how to vote, right? And we taught, we, one, that you and I have to move from a political worldview to a biblical worldview. You and I in America, if you were born and raised in America, you most of the time have a political worldview when it comes to voting. So we got to figure out how to move out of that into a biblical worldview. That was week one. Then week two, we told you how to navigate relationships with people who don't always agree with you. You seen any of those people lately? Right? You had any social media fights with those people lately? Right? We told you how to do that. You stand for truth, but full of grace, the same way that Jesus interacted with people. And then last week we asked a very interesting question is how would you live if America ceased to exist? And now this week I'm presenting an opportunity to you that, that maybe, just maybe, uh, God is trying more than uh, to, to put somebody in a political office at this season of our lives. Maybe, just maybe, he's actually trying to develop you and me into the person he wants us to be so that we can be who we need to be after November 5th. Come on, I want to talk to you today. Nick Saban's retired, but the process is still important. How many of you know that? The process is still important. I'm going to get off football, you know, that's fine, whatever, but I'm going to get on fishing. How many of you are fishermen, fisher, women? I don't know how to be politically correct with that. Fishermen, y'all like to fish? That's how we can do it. You like to fish? There's a process of fishing, is there not? Because I remember as a kid, I brought, I brought some fishing poles. I remember as a kid uh, that, that my dad had these. These are called bait casters. Right? And they were laying on this side of the boat. He used to fish a lot. He used to fish in tournaments. He used to take out all the time. And, uh, and I would go, ooh, shiny. <laughs> but as a kid, I'll give you one guess at what he told me. That is not yours. That's not yours. Yours is over here on this side of the boat. And what was over here on this side of the boat? Come on, it started out with a brim buster, everybody. Come on, a brim buster. How many of you are, uh, are brim buster people? You like to cork fish. You like, it takes no skill, no effort, no nothing. You just put a, a worm on the deal and just sit there and wait till it goes under. And then it's like, oh, got one. <laughs> got one. Got one. Come on, we all got to start somewhere. Some of y'all just never progressed. Okay? So you go from a brim buster and then you go to uh, Paw Patrol, everybody. Paw Patrol. <laughs> You remember Paw Patrol? I remember when I graduated uh, from Brim Buster School <laughs> and I got to click the button and I was like, this is awesome. Most of the time it still had the cork and I still had to wait for it and then I had to pull and reel. But at least I got to throw and at least I got to go, right? But then I started looking at dads and I was like, but you're bigger than mine. 
right? And then I graduated from Paw Patrol, and then I went to, come on, a good old Zebco 33. How many of you know the Zebco 33 life? That's lost since he's like, that's mine, don't mess it up. <laughs> I felt like a real man, you know what I'm saying? Like, my, mine's almost the same size, but it's still easy. You still only click the button, throw. But now it's longer, so now it takes a little bit more skill to cast. Right, so now I'm trying to figure all that out. And then you graduate from a Zebco, and then you come to a little spinning reel or an open face reel. That's a little bit harder, right? Because now you got to figure out how to take the line with your finger, how to flip the bail, and then when to, this has got a real hook, so I ain't throwing it. Just don't, don't. <laughs> but when to let go of the line so that it goes where you want it to go, right? And then all of a sudden, now I got good at that, I did the process of figuring out how to cast, and then dad said, here, t today's the day. And I went, this is awesome. <laughs> but if you're a fisherman, or at least have experience with bait casters, there's one thing that you don't wanna do, and it's called backlash or bird's nest. And you're like, I don't know what that means. Well, if you throw this and you don't throw it right and you don't put your thumb on the line at the right time, all of a sudden this looks like a bird's nest. How creative are the people that came up with that? So I'm just going to be honest, right in here, watch out. I practiced this morning and I landed perfectly right on the step. First service happened and I hit the wall and the line kind of landed. I gave you fair warning, you're still sitting there. So, so what happens though, if you don't know how to use it, what happens is when you release it, But now there's a problem because I didn't trust the process. Now it looks a whole lot like I'm going to be spending more time digging this out than fishing. You ever been there before? Anybody really ever been there? Come on, you're trying to, you're trying to figure it out. Here, here's how this ties in. Some of you are going, I don't know where we're going. Here's where we're going. This is what some of your brains look like during political season. We're so twisted up, tangled up. What should we do? What should we say? How should we act? We got non-believers telling us what believers should do and act and think. And I'm like, two genders? One gender? Five genders? 27? Like, where do we? And my mind is so wrapped up, and I don't know what's going on, and there's so much political noise out there that I don't even know where I stand anymore. Can I tell you, if you're not careful, you'll let a political season make you inoperable because you know what happens after this if you if you didn't know enough when you released it to put your thumb back on the line to keep the line straight it looks like this and then to make it worse what I used to do as a kid I would backlash like that and then I would just start oh yeah that's all the fishermen right there and now can I tell you if I actually tried to throw it it wouldn't cast it wouldn't cast more than the front row, maybe, because I'm so tangled up, messed up, and I don't know where I'm at. Can I tell you, don't let your head get like this during a political season that we're in. And listen, all the voices, it'll get you here. It'll get you to the place where you lose focus on the gospel of Jesus. Go to Galatians chapter 1. Here's how it all ties in. Galatians chapter 1. The church at Galatia was in kind of the same context. A little bit different issue, but kind of the same context. Look at what it says right here. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. It says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God. Who did what? Who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. Uh-oh. But it's not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Can I use my seminary degree for a minute? I don't, I don't bring it out often because re in reality it's more Cheyenne's, but her name isn't on it. 
but there's pieces of seminary that I caught. You know that whole phrase, twisting the truth right there? You know the actual original text and what it means? It means to pervert. To pervert the gospel. How many different ways is the gospel being perverted in 2024? It was being perverted then too. See, the, the hot topic issue back then was circumcision. We still got hot topics, but how many of you are grateful that's not one of them? <laughs> it's just like, I'm grateful. Right? So the, the hot topic back then was circumcision. So Paul came in, started this church. He started preaching to him. He said, hey, here's the gospel. The gospel is Jesus loved you so much that he left heaven to come to earth. He paid your sin debt. He died on the cross, put in the tomb, and then what he did is he rose from the dead three days later. And if you believe he is the son of God and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, then at that point you are saved. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And then the church at Galatia, he left, started a whole bunch of other churches, and then they started going, yeah, 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 that's a good gospel, but what if we also add this? So they say, yeah, that's a good gospel, follow that gospel, but you also have to get circumcised. Come on, I'm tired of people telling me that are non-believers how to be a believer. Well, you're, you're a follower of Jesus. You, you, you're supposed to love everybody. Yeah. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say that my definition of love <laughs> and your definition of love are probably not the same. Because what you need and what you mean by love everybody is just go, you can do whatever you want, wherever you want, whatever you want, however you want. And Jesus is still love you. My definition of love is Jesus looked at the lady and said, go and sin no more. But if my head is all backlashed, then I lose focus on the true gospel. Can I just give you the true gospel for a second? The process, the process. You and I can't forget the process. Here's the process of a follower of Jesus. You, we're going to throw it up on the screen for you. Here's the number one. You accept the grace of God through his salvation. That's step one. God's whole purpose of sending Jesus is so that he could draw you to himself so that you would receive salvation for the sacrifice that he made on your behalf. Right? Step one. Accept the grace of God through salvation. Then the second step is grow in the knowledge of who God is. How many of you know if we can figure out the true character of God, you won't, you won't be standing on a fence on how to vote. Right. Not that you'll be happy with whoever you got to vote for, but you'll know what issues you stand for and what issues you are against because of the character of God. So he says you know the character of God. That's step two. Step three is now you allow that understanding, what you just got told, what you read through Scripture, you allow that to mold your life to impact people for the kingdom of heaven. And then at one point, you and I are going to take our last breath here. Did you know that's coming? For all of us. Like there will be a day when you just go, <gasps> done. So what's the next step in the process? Right there, spend eternity with God. Simple process, is it not? Simple process. You accept salvation through the sacrifice that Jesus made. You get in the word so that you can read and understand the knowledge of the character of God. Then you allow his character to change your character, to change everybody else around you, so that one day he'll look at you after you take your last breath and go, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the process. But somewhere in between accepting the grace of God and spending eternity with him, our brains turn to bird nests. And we lose focus on the gospel. That's what they did. He says, you have listened to people who pervert the gospel. And then he goes on, look at the next part of the verse, verse 8. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. Paul makes this statement, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us. This is important, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again what we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcome, let that person be 
cursed. You want some more original language? You know the original language of that phrase, let them be cursed? You know what it actually means? Let them be damned to hell. Can you see the sincerity that Paul had in his heart when it starts talking about people perverting the gospel? He says, even us, if we preach a different gospel, if we get to a point in our culture where we go, Jesus loves you and he cares for you and you can live however you want to during the week and you can get here on Sunday and he'll hear your prayers and he'll hear your cries and he'll follow you and he has good things for you and then you can leave and act and do whatever you want to. That sounds better, so let's just do that. Paul said, no, no, no. If we start preaching that, let me be damned to hell. I don't know if you know this. I, I've, uh, I've, not, I've not given a whole lot of my stuff to you. How many of you know the things that happen to me aren't yours to carry most of the time? But, but uh, one, <laughs> at, at one point in, in the church world, in the history of the church, uh, I, I was, was told that I was a false prophet. I didn't think I was, so I went to look. So I think I got a pretty good understanding of what a false prophet is, but let me go, let me go check it out and let me see. And did you know a false prophet is anybody who preaches anything other than the gospel? Paul says, if I preach anything other than Jesus came from heaven to earth to bear your sins, to die your death, he rose on the third day to give you victory. And if you confess that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you can be saved. If I preach anything other than that, let me be damned to hell. And in 2024, can I tell you, this has also got to be our stance. We can't be so backlashed in our brain that we forget the true gospel. We got to be focused. How do you and I get our line as straight as we can, focused on the target of Jesus, and along the way become fishers of men? Ooh, like I, I, I just, I didn't even say that at the first service. But in order to catch the right fish, you got to be in the right line. And in 2024, let us not forget who actually saved us. It's the gospel that actually saved us. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says this. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. So now make sure that you stay free and you don't get all tied up again in slavery to the law. Don't get sidetracked for another gospel that is no gospel at all. You and I have to be focused, set on the gospel of Jesus because that is the only gospel that will actually free anybody. So you and I got to be set on the gospel of Jesus. Go down to verse, uh, uh, go to chapter 6. I'm going to skip. Go down, go down to chapter 6, verse 12. Chapter 6, verse 12. I'm going to read this, and I want you to think about people who have tried to lead you astray. Just think about it. And, and if you want to, not saying you got to, <laughs> but if you want to, you can think about the election. Okay? Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. 2024, those who are trying to force you to act a certain way, do a certain thing, be a certain person, are just trying to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision do not keep the whole law themselves. 2020. They only want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about it and claim you as their disciple. Did you know Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, whatever, they don't care about you. All they want to do is claim you as their disciple yeah but he's he's fighting yeah but she's for uh, uh, uh. don't get so tangled up and twisted up here that you forget what you and I are all about it goes on and it says and as for me may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ because of that cross watch this my interest in this world has been crucified Come on, somebody. 
What a way to end a political series. My interest in this world has been crucified. It's been crucified. Talk more about that in just a second. And he goes on and says, and the world's interest in me has also died. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. So because of the, cry, the, the cross of Christ, my interest in this world has been crucified. So what am I telling you? Not to vote. Just forget about it. Don't be interested in it at all. Don't do anything. No, no, no. If you remember week one, what did I tell you? Go vote. There was a study done out of a college in Arizona uh, that said this year, they're estimating this year alone, 35 million Christians won't vote. But yet after November 5th and especially after January, we'll start complaining about all the things that are going on no matter who gets in office. And then I'm looking at you going, but where are you at? Sitting on the couch because you didn't have good options? No, you got, a, you got a right. And in reality, you got an obligation. Oh, well, Jesus didn't vote, but Jesus didn't have your government. He didn't. They had a king. And he says, whatever belongs to Caesar, give to Caesar. But whatever belongs to God, give to God. So you want me to rephrase that in 2024? Like, oh, heretic. No. You got to go vote. Get, give your vote to your candidate, but give your life to Jesus. Give your vote to your candidate, but give your life to Jesus. Come on, vote. You got to vote. Are you kidding me? 35 million Christians? What would happen if all the Christians just voted? Would we defeat a little bit of evil and put back a little bit of the Holy Spirit? 35 million Christians aren't going to vote this year, estimated. You better not be sitting at the house November 5th. Figure out where you go right now. If you don't know where you go, figure out where you go. Well, I moved. I can't. I looked the other day, and we've moved since the last time we voted, and, uh, and I don't really know where I'm going, so I'm going, okay, where do I vote? You got to find it out and go and give your candidate your vote, but give your life to Jesus. So this is my last time standing in front of you talking about politics before you vote. So I'm going to take this opportunity, and I'm going to talk closed fist issues. Are you good with some closed fist issues? Like some things that you and I have to be, I'm not compromising on these. Come on, the, the, the perverted gospel looks good, feels good. You give to vision builders today, you write a check, got to have you a jet in the parking lot. This would be awesome. That's not the gospel. It's not how it works. So you and I can't get sidetracked and my minds get so tangled that we forget that true Gospel. So what are closed fist issues? What, what are the things that I'm going on November 5th going, I can't compromise this? Number one, Israel. Yes. Did you even know that was a part of your topic that you needed to talk about? But I want to read you this verse, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. It says, I will make you great. This is God talking to Israel. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. They already have been. For multiple years, they already have been. And then he makes this statement. Watch this. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. This is coming out of the mouth of God. Don't get mad at me. So pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, pro-Israel, don't get mad at me. I'm just, I'm, I'm reading Scripture. And what does God say to Israel? I'll make you into a great nation, but I will also bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So close fist issue, you need to figure out which side of this topic you're on. And you need to figure out now which side I'm on and now you got to go, okay, now which side of this topic is this candidate on? And there you go. Figure it out. Because you and I can't be against Israel. Do you know why? Because the Bible says that you and I, as followers of Jesus, as people who are children of the King, you and I have been grafted in to the tree of Israel. So in reality, you are an Israeli. You just might not be from there. You might not have been born there. Not, might not be any of your earthly lineage. 
But as a follower of Jesus, I am grafted into the family of God. So you and I got to be for Israel. It's a close fist issue. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's a close fist issue. Okay, you want to know another close fist issue is uh, the sanctity of life. We talked about this a little bit uh, in one of those weeks. They all run together now, so I don't know which one was which. Go watch them all and there you go. The sanctity of life. Do you know that, that, the, that the battle for human life coming out of the womb has been the biggest battle in our nation for like 50 something years? The sanctity of life. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. He created human beings in his own image. So an attack on the image bearer is a direct attack on the image giver. An attack on an image bearer is a direct attack on an image giver. So when it comes to abortion, let's go, I, you and I got to be close fist issue. Week one, I told you fight for family. That's what 2024 is all about. It's a fight for family. The enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy the family. If he can take the family, he can take the country. Yeah. He can take the world. He can take it all. So you and I got to fight for families. And it's fighting for people who can't fight for themselves. You and I got to be close fist issue on abortion. Here's another thing that I think you can take to the polls with you is close fist issue on gender. Yeah. Look at the last part of verse 27, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Don't get mad at me. If you and I are actually followers of Jesus, this is a closed fist issue. There, there's not one gender. There's not 15. There's not 27. There's two. And I didn't write the playbook on that. God did. So as a follower of Jesus, I'm a closed fist issue on gender. Okay, here's another one. Closed fist issue on marriage. Close fist issue on marriage. So Matthew chapter 19, these, these letters are in red. Do you know what that means? So that means Jesus said it. Look at this. He says, haven't you read the scriptures? Oh, can I tell you why we've been putting the, the Bible reading plans in front of you all 2024? Can I tell you why? Because if you don't read the Bible, you don't know its character. If you don't know its character, you don't know how to live. And if you don't know how to live, you don't know how to vote. And if you don't know how to vote, you don't know how to do anything. Because you don't know the character of God. You're just going to live however you want to. Oh, the bird's nest gospel looks great. But that's not the true gospel. Right? He goes on. He says this. Haven't you read the scriptures? They record that from beginning God made them male and female. And he said this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Okay, I got to stop. I got three minutes. You got to listen fast. You ready? I got to talk to the good old boy southern person in the room. I grew up in Enterprise. Like, I'm from the south. Let's go. I love my mama, sweet tea. <laughs> but we got a culture in the south. And the culture in the south is I know about God and I love my mama, so I'm going to heaven. Can I tell you that's a perverted gospel? Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. So at some point in the good old boy sy symptoms, you got to go, I surrender my life to you. Can I talk to us good old boys for a minute? You and I are just as much in charge of protecting the sanctity of marriage more so than non-believers. Can I tell you the divorce rate in Christians is above 50% right now? And you're a follower of Jesus? You're like, man, this is pre you're pretty harsh on this topic. No, 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 I'm, I'm not harsh on the topic. I'm not harsh. He, he literally says, this explains why a man will leave his father and mother and is joined to his life, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split what God has joined together. Get over yourself. It 
is not about you. sick and tired of watching people who claim to be followers of Jesus that are okay with the enemy splitting up a family. How in the world are we going to stand idly by and just be okay with divorce? And I get it. I, I get that I can very well offend you right now, but you know what? I don't care. You getting something 830 didn't get. Because my Bible tells me that I got to stand firm and preach the gospel, even if it's offensive. Can I tell you something real quick about the gospel? It is offensive. The gospel always will be, it always has been, and it is always meant to be offensive. It is meant to offend you so that it can change you, so that you can live with him forever. That's the process. What's the process? Accept salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus. Know God's character through his word. Let his character change your character so that when you take your last breath, people will feel the church, they'll feel the funeral home, they'll feel the deal, and they'll go, if it wasn't for them and how they love Jesus and how they live this out, then I wouldn't be who I am today. But yeah, we got, we got people in the army of the kingdom of heaven that are laying down going it just be easier you got to check yourself because if we're going to go as followers of Jesus going to close fist issue marriages between a man and a woman I'm all about that but I'm also all about the last part of that scripture not just man and woman but let nobody you know who nobody is nobody you know where you fall in the category of nobody you're a nobody. In that scripture, let nobody separate. And I'm sick and tired of watching America crumble because the enemy's out to steal, kill, and destroy your family. But I'm also sick and tired of watching the church crumble. You want to know the reason why unbelievers don't care a lick about whether you think a man and a woman should be together? And that's how marriage should be. They don't care a lick about that because they've watched our lives. And they said, it don't really matter to you. Because if it did, that wouldn't happen. If it did, that percentage wouldn't be 50 plus. If it actually mattered to you, it wouldn't. Come on, is it easy? Absolutely not. Marriage is the hardest thing you'll ever do. But is it biblical? Yeah. So close fist issues. Israel, close fist issue. Gender, close fist issue. Sanctity of life, close fist issue. Marriage, close fist issue. I can't waver. I can't go out of that. The perverted gospel looks real nice, especially when it's hard in my life. But the perverted gospel is no gospel at all. So how do you vote November 5th? Close fist issues. Give your vote to your candidate, but come on, give your life to Jesus. Give your vote to your candidate. Give your life to Jesus. Point you bow your head with me and close your eyes. One. If you're here and you haven't given your life to Jesus, can I tell you that, that this world is as good as it gets? This is as good as it gets. You're like, well, it's going to be better if. No, no, no. This is as good as it gets. Because if you die separated from God, that's the last part of the process, right? That you would take your last breath. But if you take your last breath and you're separated from God for all of eternity, this is as good as it gets. Can you imagine 
Just think about this for a second. You feel lonely now and the presence of God is right in front of you. Can you imagine how lonely you'll feel for all of eternity when it's not present, when the spirit of God is not present in your presence? So when you get to the end of your process here and you take your last breath, can I tell you today, I want, I want you to be able to stand in front of Jesus and I want him to look you in the eye and go, well done. Well done, my good and faithful son. Well done. But the only way that happens is if you go back to step one in the process. Complete the process. See, step one is that you would accept the salvation that God has for you through the sacrifice of the person of Jesus. And no matter what happens between step one and the last step where you stand in front of him, if you get step one right, you can work on all the rest. See, 2024, I'm, I'm telling you, the enemy is make, making you doubt the whole book of Genesis. And if he can make you doubt the whole book of Genesis, then the rest of the Bible is at play. It's up in the air. But can I tell you the same way, if you plant your life at the first part of the book of Genesis, you may not know what the rest of scripture says and may not comprehend all that it's talking about, but can I tell you, you'll, you'll figure it out along the way. And if you'll take step one today and give your life to Jesus, you won't have it all figured out and you won't get it all right, but at some point along the way, you'll figure it out. But you gotta say yes to him first. You gotta surrender your life to him today. So all around the room, you ready? If you have never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, here's what I want you to do. Nobody looking around, all I want you to do is on, on three, I want you to lift your hand. To just go, I need a relationship with him today. All around the room, you ready? Here we go, one two, three, just put it up. Say, yeah, that's me. I need Jesus today. I need Jesus today. Come on, leave him up for just a second. I see you. Yep. Yep. See you guys on that road too. Yeah. Ma'am, I see you back here in the back. Yep. See you back here in the corner too. Come on, you put your hands down. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Nothing special about this prayer. It's your heart to God's. So just right there under your breath, just tell him. You can say, Jesus, I need you. Tell him. Say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you came for me. I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried for me. But I believe that God raised you from the dead for me. I receive your salvation. I receive your forgiveness. Nothing else matters except for the new creation that you're turning me into. Thank you for changing my life.